Okay, so we should talk a little about decimals, just because that's material that some of that anyone teaching a higher grade will have to teach to students. I'm afraid that some of this material isn't very uh, fascinating, you know, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing decimals is, is what it is. But let's make sure, first of all, that we are on the same page here. So thinking back to, well, thinking back to the base stuff, actually, when we have a number, it's got a ones face and a tens face and a hundreds face and so on. So if you have, say, a seven here, and a two here, and a three here, and a four here, you've got 7,200, three tens, and a four. 7,234. A decimal just grows that idea by giving you faces that are less than one. A one-tenths face, a one-hundredths one face, a one-one-thousandths face, and so on. This pattern, you know, one over 10 to the first, one over 10 to the second, one over 10 to the third, the next would be one over 10 to the fourth, a one ten thousandth face, and the pattern repeats itself. So if you have, say, a one here, that's 7,234 and a tenth. If you have a one here and a two here, well, that's going to end up being 7,234 and 12 one hundredths. We have one tenth and we have two one hundredths, and if we get a common denominator, that's twelve hundredths. So decimals um, are basically an alternative to fractions. So, I mean, that's slightly oversimplifying stuff, but when you have fractions, that gives you a way of talking about numbers that aren't whole numbers. You know, a number between 7,234 and 7,235. And decimals gave you a way of talking about that, and fractions give you a way of talking about that. And decimals and fractions have their advantages and disadvantages. I guess starting out, the main advantage of a decimal is that it's very easy to interpret. If you have two decimals, it's very easy to tell which is bigger than the other. 
if you want to add, subtract, multiply, and divide decimals, on the one hand, it's kind of tedious to do by hand, but you don't have to worry about, you know, okay, here I have a common denominator, here I don't need a common denominator, but I'm dividing, so I need to flip. Um, they act a lot like natural numbers in many ways, which I think is probably their main advantage. So we've talked kind of in our introductory remarks about taking a decimal and rewriting it as a fraction. What if we have a fraction and we want to rewrite it as a decimal? Well, in some cases, that's going to be simple. In other cases, it's going to be a pain. You know? And I mean, the, it's going to be simple if your denominator is nice, and it's going to be a pain if your denominator is not nice, essentially. So the way to think of this, in one way we have, you know, just the tens face and the hundreds face. But decimals work a little differently from fractions in the following way. Say we have 25 over 100. Well, we're not allowed to just put the 25 in the hundreds place. What we are allowed to do is put the 5 in the hundreds place and then move left and put the 2 in the next place. We have 17 over 10,000. So we've got a one-tenth face, a one-one-hundredth face, a one-one-thousandth face, and a one-ten-thousandth face. And again, we've got 17 ten thousands, but we're not allowed to write that. We're not allowed to put a number that's bigger than nine in any place. So we can only put the seven there, and then we move to the left and we put the one there. And now, we fill in any extra places with zero. Zero point zero zero one seven. So that's good news. I mean, what's bad news is there are many um, denominators we can have that are not the hundred or a thousand or ten thousand. And the instant you have something like five over eight, if you want to turn this into a decimal by hand, things are about to take kind of a nasty turn, I'm afraid. Um, five over eight is a fraction, but it's also division. It's five divided by eight. So the way we go from a fraction like this to a decimal, Well, 
we can try to do the division and see what happens. And if we just did the division as it's written on the whiteboard, what would happen would be that it would go in zero times and we'd have a remainder of five, zero remainder five. Um, that's not helpful for our purposes. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in a decimal place here. And this decimal place will copy up there. And then after the decimal place, an indeterminate number of zeros. Um, you don't have to write all of those in. I just, you know, think of having as many zeros as you want to the right of the decimal place. So eight went into five, zero times. Yeah, no, absolutely not. That very pale color is probably not what I need here. So zero times eight is a zero. We do the subtract. And now we'll drop something down. We'll drop that to zero down. And at this point, we're done with the decimal faces. We're going to pretend that decimal point isn't there. We're just going to do everything as usual. In the sense that eight goes into 50, um, 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48. It goes in six times. Then six times eight is 48. We do the subtraction. 50 minus 48 is two. Eight does not go into two. We have as many zeros to drop down as we want to. We drop a zero down. Eight goes into 20 twice. Two times eight is 16. 20 minus 16 is four. Eight does not go into four. We drop down a zero. And finally, eight does go into 40. It goes into 40 five times. And when we do, good morning, when we do this subtraction and we get a remain and we get zero, it means we're done. So five over eight is zero point six two five. What you'll find, though, sometimes when you try to do this, is that a number that can be written very nicely as a fraction cannot always be written very nicely as a decimal. I've said what I think the advantages of decimals are. It's easy to rank them, multiplication and addition and subtraction all sort of work in expected ways without a bunch of hidden rules. The disadvantage of decimals, I mean, just even looking at this example, writing this fraction took two letters, 
writing that decimal took four letters. Three, I guess, technically. But I, if there's a zero in front of the decimal place, I always like to write it. And we sort of see this um, in the stereo. If we take one divided by three, and we say, well, we're going to take this very nice fraction and we're going to turn it into a decimal. Again, we don't, I mean, there are an infinite number of zeros after the decimal place. We don't, we cannot write all of them. I normally just write enough that we kind of get the message. And then we say, well, three doesn't go into one. Three goes into one is zero times. The decimal point will get copied up. Zero times three is zero. And now we're done with the decimal. One minus zero is still one. Three doesn't go into one, so we drop down a zero. Three goes into 10 three times. Three times three is nine. 10 minus nine is one. Three does not go into one, so we drop down a zero. Then three goes into 10 three times. Three times three is nine, subtract is one. Three doesn't go into one, drop down a zero. And what you're seeing, three goes into 10 three times. What you're seeing is this pattern repeating over and over. Three times three is nine, subtract, get one, drop down zero is 10. Subtract is one, three into 10. I mean, it's kind of this block. is just repeating over and over again. <clears throat> and I mean, when you've got whole numbers, there is a stopping condition. You run out of things to drop down and you get a remainder. But here, there are an infinite number of zeros, so you never run out of things to drop down, and you get this infinite string of threes. So, um, sorry, um, um, so what I was trying to say is, that some numbers when written as decimals have to be written as infinite strings of, well, of numbers, of decimals. We saw that on the previous frame, 
One divided by three, if you write it as a fraction, it's perfectly nice. If you write it as a decimal, it's not perfectly nice. It's an infinite string of three. So let's introduce some notation here. I mean, this is bad in a sense. It's this infinite string of threes. We cannot, on our notebook paper or on the whiteboard, write down an infinite string of numbers. But I mean, it's easy to describe verbally. It's just three repeated over and over again. And in a lot of situations, if you've got an infinite string of numbers, it's going to look like this. It's going to be the same thing repeated over and over again. And we have notation for that. we put a horizontal bar over the thing that's repeating. So this notation indicates that there are an infinite number of threes. And, um, we can sometimes have situations where that means our calculator up. Oh, let's see if we can find one. Okay. Five divided by seven. It's not super obvious on the calculator, actually. Let me go to some place where we can see more digits. Five divided by seven. So you see seven one four two eight five. Seven one four two eight five. Seven one four two eight five. So it's not a single digit that's repeating this time, it's a block of digits. Seven one four two eight five. And in a situation like that, you put the horizontal line over the entire thing that repeats. It can also sometimes happen, I'm not sure if I'm, I can think offhand of a good example. But it can sometimes happen that um, the first number or the first few numbers don't repeat, and then it starts to repeat. You can have a situation that looks like 0 0.172222, etc. So the 1 and the 7 only show up once, but that two then repeats infinitely often. 
So because the one to seven isn't repeating here, we don't put a line over it. But that two does repeat, so we do put a line over it. So, let's see. every fraction can be written as either. a finite decimal or to a decimal that repeats. There's actually a way to tell which is which. Um, you, this is, I mean, to me, this is sort of verging on fun facts trivia rather than something that uh, is really important in most real world settings, but if you reduce a fraction as far as possible, who, and this is something that we didn't talk about in this class, Again, we're in this kind of weird situation where we have different students with different backgrounds, but it turns out that any number can be written as the product of prime number. So you have something written as an irreducible fraction two divided by 261, that 261 can be written as the product of primes, and there's actually one reason I don't want to focus on this is that there's no good way to do that by hand. Which is uh, a good thing um, because a lot of modern um, cryptography is based on the fact that there's no fast way to do a prime factorization. And if anyone ever found such a way, everyone's like, bank details and so on would suddenly become very insecure. But Wolfram Alpha does not hesitate to deal with a three-digit number. It says that this is three times three times 29. If any prime is but two and or five show up, this is going to be 
an infinite decimal one. It's not going to terminate, it's just going to repeat something forever. And this shows you, kind of informally, but it shows you that infinite decimals are the rule rather than the exception, because there are an infinite number of primes, and any of them except for two and five result in an infinite decimal. Go to Wolfram Alpha again. Two divided by 261. Oh my goodness. Two over 261 is the same 28 uh, digits repeated over and over again. Of course, in any practical situation, you would round this to something, but it is a repeating decimal. It's just that, ooh, this, uh, this thing that repeats is very large. And you see, or maybe you don't see, I can't, well, from Alpha wants me to pay them to be able to enlarge stuff, but maybe you can see that this uh, notation we introduced is being used here with this horizontal bar over the stuff that's repeating. So, this is something you should know. We've said that every fraction can be written as a decimal. It might not be a very nice decimal, you know, that decimal we just looked at where, um, where it was this 28 digit repeating thing. That's not very nice. But every fraction can be written as a decimal, either a finite decimal or a repeating decimal. There is no vice versa here. Some decimals cannot be written as fractions, as a fraction. So, for example, I'll probably give this to you on Wednesday when we start talking about squares but there's a very famous result that the square root of two cannot be written as a fraction. The square root of two is an infinite, non-repeating decimal. Never actually tried this, so hopefully my calculator doesn't make a fool of me, but our calculator can go from decimals to fractions. If we tell it to take the square root of two and write it as a fraction, I mean, what it really should be doing is spitting up an error message saying that it's impossible, but it does the next best thing, which is just to say, well, here's the square root of two rounded to eight decimal places. We cannot do what you asked us to do. We cannot write this as a fraction. Um, I, I called this 
famous. I mean, maybe that's overstating it. Um, it's a very old result. Um, the Pythagoreans, Pythagoras, for whom the Pythagorean theorem is named, knew this result. It was apparent the cause for some consternation because Greek mathematicians didn't have decimals. Decimals are a later invention, so they weren't quite sure what to do with something that you couldn't write as a fraction. Um, pi is another really famous example. And that's famous, I mean, sort of in day-to-day -day life, if you like, interviewed people on the street. Probably less famous than the pi, but it's a very important number in mathematics. Euler's constant E is a third example of a number that cannot be written as a fraction. It's so, um, I mean, this is another what I was saying. Well, here are what I think are advantages decimals sometimes have over fractions. I mean, on a very practical level, there are a bunch of situations where you have to use decimals because there is no fraction. So, the question so far, now we've sort of done the preliminary stuff, we've done the introductory material, we ought to talk briefly, I guess, about, you know, performing arithmetic with these decimals. I might not be radiating enthusiasm just because, you know, multiplying and dividing and stuff by hand seems is, is never maybe a fun thing to do. It's kind of repetitive, but it's also something that a lot of you are going to have to teach. So we should make sure we're on the same page. So adding decimals is happily straightforward. Line up the decimal points. And if you want to, you can buffer in some zeros. I'll say what I mean by that in a moment. And do the addition as as usual. And I've never seen any of those cute tricks we learned for whole numbers. I've never seen them applied to decimals. Like adding from the left and partial sums and all of that stuff. I normally just see this with the standard what I think of as the standard addition algorithm. So let's say we have 1.17 plus 2.432. 
So we'll line them up, and we line them up at the decimal base. 2.432, Um, You'll notice that there's nothing under the two. So you have two options here. The first is to just kind of mentally say, okay, two plus nothing is still two. Your other option is that you can always add zeros to the end of a decimal, and that doesn't change the decimal. So that's what I mean when I say you can buffer in zeros. Then three plus seven is 10. Four and one and one is six. This decimal face, this decimal point, stays lined up. And then two plus one is three. So totally normal addition, except that we have that decimal face. And that decimal face we can carry as normal. Let's say one point three seven two plus four point ninety six. So we set up the crossbars, we line up the decimal places. In fact, let's put, let's change this. Let's turn that one into an 11. So we have 11.372. We have 4.96. Nothing there, but we can think of having a zero if we want. Then two plus zero is two. Seven plus six is 13, carry the one. Nine and one and three are 13. Questions? No, if you didn't see that you added 11 instead of the one. Like you turn the one into a oh, yeah. okay. Um, nine and one are ten. Three are thirteen again. So the one carries as usual. Notice that it's now to the left of the decimal face. Four and one and one are six. And then one is one. And this is why, I mean, you can throw in this zero if you want to, but you have at this point in your career already seen in a situations where there's nothing under the top number and you've been able to deal with that. So just a matter of personal preference. Let's see, five minutes left. We will, I guess we should can do subtraction in five minutes because it's basically the same. Line up the decimal places and then do it as usual. Eleven point seventeen minus three point. Four, two, one, six. So eleven point seventeen. Ooh, that may not. 
because we're going to be borrowing and stuff. Let me spread these digits out a little. 11.17, Here, it really does make a lot of sense to buffer in those zeros. We've got the decimal faces lined up. We put the decimal down here. And now, okay, zero minus six, we can't do. So we have to borrow, but there's nothing here we can borrow from. So first, we'll turn this into a six and that into a 10. Then we'll borrow and this will turn into a nine. And that will turn, now turn into a 10. Then 10 minus six is four, nine minus one is eight, six minus two is four. We can borrow from the left of the decimal exactly as usual. Um, 11 minus 4 is 7. So 0 minus 4 we can't do. Borrow. 10 minus 4 is 6. 0. 0.7484. This leaves us with multiplication and division. We will deal with those on when. So we'll also get to our test back. Sorry for the delay in getting that through.